But on behalf of the entire university community, I want to welcome you all here today for this community conversation. And when we say community, we, um, we open our arms to the whole community uh, of uh, Grand Rapids and, um, and we have invited members of the community in to this conversation. Um, before we begin with prayer, I, I want to I want to uh, address our community as as president. Um, when last week uh, I saw the video, the horrible atrocity of uh, visible to all uh, what looked like uh, to me a lynching of George Floyd. I was so um, upset that um, actually when I when I reached out to try to talk to um, advisors and friends about it, I would break down in the middle of conversation. I still do. Um, that uh, emotion is complex. It's deep. It's longstanding. It's an emotion of of lament, deep grief. And sadness that in my lifetime of 52 years that um, the things that I heard about and saw as a child still would persist in our society um, grieve me um, deeply. Um, that emotion uh, and um, the challenge of, of trying to ensure that I lead effectively in this community and not only respond out of emotion is part of the reason that it, it took me time to write something to our community to respond. Um, it also um, is, is part of my leadership style. So to the extent that it led students or faculty or staff to not feel valued, seen, or heard, um, I, uh, I want to apologize for that. Um, I will also say that, that my style of leadership is collaborative in the middle of any event or instance like this uh, or any other circumstance that I feel warrants the president's communication attention, my tendency is to be very collaborative. I reach out to friends and trusted mentors. I reach out to people who have knowledge greater than mine. I reach out to trusted advisors. And, um, and two, of the, two of the friends that I reached out to um, were Pastor Terrence Lachey, pastor of Grace of the Nations Church, and Pastor Nathaniel Moody, who is the founder, co-founder of Brownside Ministries and a third ward commissioner here in the city of Grand Rapids. Also, uh, one of the people that I, I'll, I'll just say I cried with, was my good friend and, and confidant, confidant, executive associate to the president, uh, Michelle Lloyd-Page, who had just started a leave um, that she was happy to be taking and that I wanted to protect her rest. But at, at a certain point, I knew she was one of the key people that I needed. And Christina Edmondson and Jane Bruin on our campus community were also um, folks that I reached out to. Jane Bruin is our uh, assistant dean for intercultural student development. And um, she also is here today. So these friends um, helped me in my thinking and many others that I reached out to in the past several days have helped me in my thinking. They helped me to form a response. And, um, but what I wanted to be sure of is I, I really do believe that uh, talk is cheap, that many words have been spoken that I've heard in my lifetime about the identification of racism as a sin, as a sin that's deeply embedded in our society a sin that's deeply embedded in the hearts of those who have been raised with privilege and in, and in the white culture. And that uh, I wanted to make sure that we were also as a community acting out of our mission, that not just making a statement, but, but having a conversation, convening a conversation that would be educational and formative. And, uh, and so it's for that reason today that that we gather together, but I, I do anticipate as we have gathered many times in our community to talk about faith and race and justice, that this also will be one of those occasions uh, where we renew our commitment, where we learn and listen well 
and um, where we where we confess and examine our life and our ways, both individually and institutionally, structurally and socially. It is clear to me that racism is a sin. It's a sin that that informs the subjugation and experience of Native American Native American peoples in the communities I grew up in. The subjugation and marginalization, the internment of Japanese Americans in the on the island community where I grew up. The long history of of sin against African Americans, slavery, enslavement, John Crow, um, and the the legacy of these things in the police brutality that we witness, and the continued economic and health disparities that we now experience. We see it in the Latinx community that is vilified for its color and where people seek to identify and, uh, and, and actually engage in mass shooting against a community that we, that we lamented and grieved in Texas last year and many other forms of aggression and microaggression. And to our Asian American and Asian students who experienced even in recent months, um, the stigma uh, associated with those who engaged in prejudicial act actions um, related to the COVID crisis, those who um, responded inappropriately. As a leader of an organization and as a leader of, a, of an organization with a long history uh, of and embedded in white culture, these are persistent things that are with us. And I want it to be very clear that, uh, that racism is something that, that we adamantly oppose and we will seek to oppose it and join with our friends, our brothers and sisters in this community and, in the, and in, across the country to oppose it, that that'll be something that we continue to do as part of our educational mission. So with that, I also want it to be clear that this listening exercise today, this what we learn, that we not only do it with our minds and our hearts, but actually it's a very important part of our own process of sanctification, that process where the Holy Spirit works inside us to convict us in our sin and to reveal it to us and to confess it and then to seek a new way that this is also a spiritual exercise. And so I've asked Michelle Lloyd Page to pray as she leads us, but as she prays, I've asked her to ask call upon the Holy Spirit to be present with us. And where we feel a feeling of defensiveness rising up in, in us, where we feel like it's hard to listen to something that is said, a truth that needs to be spoken, where we open our hearts and open our souls to the work that the Holy Spirit needs to do in our process of, uh, of becoming transformed people who live and work in the name of Jesus Christ. So with that, um, I invite Michelle to lead us in prayer, and I welcome our guests with a hearty welcome and, and my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God of our weary years, God of our silent and not so silent years, we are here because we are your children. We are here because of the deep pain that is experienced in individuals. We are here because of the broken social systems. We are here because we don't know what else to do but to cry out to you. So Lord, use your spirit to meet us where we are for those who are lamenting, for those who are grieving, be the only comfort that really matters in this time. Lord, for those who would be resistant to hear the pain, to dismiss it, to think that this is something that will just blow over in a day or two, by your spirit, Lord, convict them, convict them, Reveal yourself as a God of justice. Reveal yourself as a God of peace in a way that we have never seen. 
Lord, we are your people. We are your children. Be with the panelists as we speak, as we think, as we have a conversation. Help our words to enlighten. Help our words to initiate first steps. Help us, Lord. Be with us, Lord, by your spirit. In the name of the one who was and is and is to come, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. I'm sorry for misspeaking a moment ago. Someone just made me aware that I referred to Jim Crow as John Crow, and I, I do know the difference, and I apologize for misspeaking. I'm, I've got more emotion than usual when I'm talking, and, and I'm going to come off the rails once in a while, I think, so, um, so I apologize for that. Um, all right, so I'm really grateful for you gathering here today, and um, and we've got some some questions that we want to start with. I think we want to we want to kind of gather based on common assumptions, and um, and even if we have uh, sh different experiences and different perspectives. Um, Actually, uh, I'm really excited to have Pastor Lachey and Pastor Moody here as, as on the dais with us. Um, they are part of the number of congregations that we have been in dialogue with as we expand the circle of our affections as a Calvin community and envision partnerships with, with uh, congregations beyond the Christian Reformed Church and the Reformed Church of America. And so... Um, Pastor Lachey and Pastor Moody have been part of those conversations, and um, I, I really have been encouraging and affirming. And it was it's wonderful to know that we had the benefit of those relationships before a tough time like this. Um, and uh, and I had the pleasure this Sunday of, of worshiping in Pastor Lachey's virtual community and um, and learn a lot about the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. And so I really appreciate that. And so I wanna recognize the different traditions that are represented here within the Christian faith. Um, and from our faith traditions, um, I want you to speak into this set of questions. If, if we assume uh, the belief that human beings are valued, um, or the, the if we assume that racism is the belief that human beings are valued in a hierarchy according to their race. And if we, if we see that as sin, and we do, can you talk to us about how your faith perspective informs this identification of sin and, and uh, what's wrong with it? Talk about where racism is learned from your perspectives and, and how you think it might be unlearned. Um, because it's so foundational, it's so endemic, there are so many ways that we're socialized into understandings. And, um, and I would appreciate from a faith perspective if you could speak into that, but also practical, sociological, um, experiential. Pastor Lachey, Is that for any one of us to go first? Yeah. Yeah, Pastor Lachey, why don't you go ahead first, but you're muted, so there we go. Great, there we go. Um, thank you so much again. Um, uh, I was going to say Pastor Leroy because of the magnitude of your work at, at Calvin University and the community. It's much like um, a pastor's role, you know, ready to pivot at any moment, um, responsible for feeling the infirmities of the people, but then also um, having to be bold enough to, to take steps and actions. And I want to commend you for this step. When um, I got a call from you the other evening, I was just leaving the march downtown. In fact, originally I was at the march when I got your text and um, because of the noise, couldn't couldn't call. But the irony was that you you weren't physically present to see the magnitude of what was happening, but yet on a spiritual level, you were connected to your community. You were connected to being here in Grand Rapids, although you were traveling across the country. And I just wanna commend you for being responsive very quickly, um, as opposed to being you know post responsive. You were in the middle of, doing life and yet you pause to say let's keep our connection some of our previous conversations have always afforded us dialogue and opportunity to talk and i appreciate that so thank you to to you and then of course the the calvin university community 
And um, Dr. Michelle Lloyd Page, you know that we go back a little ways to to hanging out with the choir. Um, so that's a blessing. I want to respond to the question and then give some time to the other panelists um, that I respect very, very much. Uh, I, I believe personally that what we are facing is this implicit assumption, of course, that human beings are less than those. Those things come from our culture. And when I say culture, I don't mean um, individual ethnic identity as much as I'm saying the environments and our families of origin. It comes from the environments that are um, affirming of negative behaviors, negative attitudes, negative dispositions, just bitterness and hatred. I've talked to scores and scores of people in the Forest Hills um, Institutes for Healing Racism. That's one of the areas that I've worked in the last for the last 10 years in helping to do some some reconciliation. And and many people confess that they learned racism. They learned um, the superiority mentality. These are things that I believe are subculture and we bring them to a larger culture and that's when we start getting the negative response the negative influence and the fallout and that's what we're experiencing right now i'm going to just pause and give somebody else an opportunity to to uh, relate to that question as well mr moody would you like to respond yes uh i think one of the most important things that we had to truly understand uh is number one thank you for having me today uh in response to that question i don't know if you can see me or not uh, but I hope you can hear me. Uh, I believe that uh, racism is definitely a sin, but the number one thing that causes racism to continue to uh, perpetuate itself because it has been taught in the churches of history for years, especially within the Anglo church, uh, a, a superiority that God is white, a superiority that anything that is white is pure, and anything less than that is beneath. Uh, and then it trickles down into families. So in order for racism and the hatred of racism to disappear, we got to start preaching racism, especially our white pastors. They got to start preaching racism from the pulpit. If it's a sin, then we need to be teaching people how to repent from it. Michelle, you're muted. Did you hear? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Moody. Thank you. I just wanted to say, yeah, I I, I affirm seeing brothers and what they have um can and I know it's just because of everything that's going on and the emotions, but I I got tripped up over the word our when we are talking about our faith traditions as if it's one faith tradition. Um, I'm, and I'm still honestly struggling with that. I, I am a believer. I am a pastor, um, have been a believer all my life. I've have a nonprofit ministry, but when I look over the years history of, of the church, I wonder if this is really our faith. I know it is. So I don't need to see people lighting up the chat. I, I know it is, but in terms of what it feels like, because when I remember early introductions about race in the church, um, in every social institution that you can name, black people and other people of color were less than. Um, how many times have we heard the curse of Ham to justify the racial hierarchy that we have. And you don't have to go back 40 years, 50 years. You don't even have to go back 10 years ago from the last time that I've heard that. When I look at the wider evangelical church and especially white evangelicals who are supposedly championing the cause of Christ and Christianity, and I look at the decisions that they make in the voting booth, I wonder if this is really our faith. So I can talk about how my faith informs me because my faith tells me I am made in the image of God. And no matter what social institutions, no matter what media outlet says about people who look like me, I know I look like God. 
And where does it come from? You name it. You name the social institution. I, I, I'm a sociologist, trained sociologist, and I cannot think of one social institution that doesn't have racism embedded in it. And so we can talk about it structurally, we can talk about it individually, we can talk about it culturally. Let's just talk about it. But let's not just talk about it in a, an academic way, but talk about it in a way that is honest, talk about it in a way that it's experienced, talk about the real pain and suffering that is out there, because we don't talk about it in the church. And the church is one of the prime ways that it continues to go out, especially within the Christian organizations. Dr. Lloyd Page, I want to interject that you mentioned the institution of the church in particular, and I think that uh, Pastor Moody said that in most churches, you'll see two flags. Um, you'll see the Christian flag and you'll also see the American flag. And the honor of being able to bear those flags, I think, goes without saying to any Christian organization or any Christian um, unit. But the reality is, is that both of those flags perpetrate something other than what they were originally established for. So I just want to put that out, that we have some undoing, some unteaching, some unlearning that has to happen before we can even begin to move forward, because history in and of itself has been omitted to disinclude the atrocity of the slave trade that was supported by a Christian organization that was funded by those people who call themselves Christians. And yet the fallout from that is what we have today. I, I'm gonna pause right there. And let me add to that too, Pastor Lachey. All right. Uh, keep in mind that the Confederate flag was once still in uh, churches and courthouses across the Mason-Dixon. We just recently began to talk about the Confederate flag being taken down. Uh, the Confederate flag uh, truly represents uh, a stronghold of white supremacy and white Christian values within the South that also has a strong effect within the Northern cities as well. And that's where you have to look at, as I said earlier, that if you're looking for racism to be unlearned or to be uh, re uh, taught in a different way uh, in terms of denouncing it, you got to begin in the churches, you got to begin in the homes, and you got to begin in government. That's where it's going to end. But more so, the pastors, and I reiterate this, pastors and educators are key to the dismantling of uh, racism and its hatred. For me, I don't even like using the word race, the construct of race because it's a social construct that attached value to people based on what they look like, not their, their value or their, um, in their genetic makeup. It basically has to do with what you look like. And I feel like even when we acknowledge that, like when we talk about that, we need to acknowledge that that's not even something that's real or scientifically rooted. It's something that was rooted so that people could center certain people over other people. And when I read Galatians, I know that every person has the same value. And um, so I grew up, it's weird, I am an immigrant from Asia, but I grew up in the CRC church and we did a lot of reading of the Heidelberg Catechism. And I think about the sixth commandment and I think about thou shalt not kill and what that means. So I think, of, so I'm gonna quote a little bit of the Heidelberg to you, but when it talks about what does it mean to not kill? I'm not to belittle, I'm not to insult, I'm not to hate, I'm not to kill my neighbor. Not only that, I'm not to participate in when anyone else does that. Not only that, I am positively toward, have to promote life, promote peace for all the people that are God's people, which are all of us. So I get really heated sometimes because I don't understand why in the church that I grew up in, catechism, and yet there's still very clear ways that this person is more than this person. And, I, and that always has bothered me. Um, I think in a lot of churches, the faith traditions that I grew up in, that was definitely the thing. Um, I have always wanted to be a missionary. And even the fact that the mission agency that I once was a part of was called the Heathen Mission Board for a while, right? Those things of like placing value on people. I think that that's a deep unlearning and not only a thing that we need to um, we need to repent of, but like it needs to change in all the places that we talk about it, all of our institutions. 
Sorry. And you mentioned the, the, the heathen mission board. I think that many of our uh, institutions have heathen leadership. And uh, if we're gonna put the, if we're going to ascribe the term heathen, definitionally, we could probably flip the script. Um, I want to share this, and I shared it with with uh, President uh, Michael about one of my first encounters with the Calvin community was when I came here 18 years ago um, to become the pastor of Grace for the Nations Church. At the time, it was called Grace Pentecostal, and um, we evolved. We've changed the name to be more inclusive and to reach out to the nations or people from all walks of life. And my wife and I decided to attend one of the winter symposiums. It was a, one of the uh, a graduate student was presenting a paper he had written on the CRC's role in the transatlantic slave trade. And it was such an informative experience and almost an admission to the church's involvement in the atrocity of slavery um, in America, as well as in Africa or from Africa to America. And when the timeline began to unfold, it was it was mind blowing for me to see that we've got generation after generation after generation, even after the slave trade has ended, still perpetrating and profiting from this imbalance. And I put that word out there intentionally, profit, because that's part of the reason that America has turned its head or turned her head or, or, or even covered her eyes in shame because there's a direct connection between profitability and what we now find the perpetration of hatred toward races of people. I agree with you, Jane, about um, the races, but we do find in the book of Revelation that in the end, we will be identifiably different nations, kindreds, and tongues. And so now it's important for us to be um, what we would call monolithic in our Christian thinking, but our identity can be respected, you know, black, white, brown, otherwise. And when we get to heaven, if we make it there, we're going to stand before the throne where there'll be people from every kindred, nation, and tongue speaking praise and worship to a God who, as, as Dr. Michelle said, who looks like, who we look like, all of us look like him, all of us, black, white, or otherwise. So I just wanted to, to also interject that about my experience with Calvin, um, and it drew me closer because I wanted to know more of the narrative, more of the narrative, more of the narrative, or even what was coming out of the educational portals of the school. Uh, is there is there an opportunity for people to know the truth, or is it just simply a clandestine reality of, you know, here we are, and there they are. The we and they, I think, needs to be identified. The yeah. so, uh, majority of people uh, who are of color in America, and especially African Americans, have been uh, taught to be reconditioned. We've been taught to emulate, and we've been taught to follow what is supposed to be the white rule of America. Uh, and lose an identity in the process. So when we're talking about race and racism, where when I hear the word racism, I'm more so speaking of the hatred part of racism. Because racism, in my opinion, is evil. And it begins with a, another race who feels threatened by the power or the authority of the race in which they have some control over. Racism and the problems that we're having right now in this country is not a black person or Indian's problem. It's a white problem. And the white problem has to be fi fixed by the white race. We are just recipients of the pain that is inflicted upon us because of the fear that has been taught to our white brothers and sisters by their own white government. I would I would say also if we're thinking about how do we unlearn racism, I think you have to see it. Uh, you have to feel it, and um, and when I say feel it, I mean understand that it's not just their pain or their pain. Who is the ethnic or racial group of the month that's being targeted? But no, we are we are feeling this pain because, especially if I'm using Christian language, we are the body of Christ, and when one part of the body hurts, the other part of the body hurts as well. Um, and so, until we 
feel this pain. And I think that's some of what we're seeing going on now with the protests, that there's a little bit of feeling that pain. But then we have to want to do something about it. And so when I think of um, Pastor Lachey's you know, observation about the profit in this, there, there's a reason there's stratification in this country. There, there's a reason we continue to have a segment of the population that is poor and lives below the poverty line. There's a reason we don't have a universal um, living wage for all workers. There, there's a reason. It's because as much as we like to say in this country that we value equality, it's a lie. We value inequality because inequality means that I can better myself at someone else's expense. Or let me rephrase that. What inequality means is that someone who has more power, more privilege than I do can better themselves at my expense. Because I'm a black woman, I don't have as much power. I am highly educated, but sometimes it doesn't matter how educated I am. Am. I'm still a black woman and I don't have all the privileges. I don't have all the access to power and privilege like the rest of the, my cabinet members. It's, it's the truth. It is the truth. I don't. And so we have to want to do something about it. And I don't know. I know I know there is frustration. I know people are upset, but I wonder what the flavor of the week will be next week. And will people still want to do something about this? Because if we if we truly do something about this, if we truly try to make this a just society, oh, things are going to have to change. Oh, absolutely. There's, absolutely. there's going to be a whole lot of discomfort. A whole lot of a lot on everybody's part is going to have to change. And I am not convinced that there is a will for that kind of change. I hope, I pray, I am wrong. You know, in triage, the main thing is to get the bleeding to stop. And I think that that's where America is right now is to try to stop the bleeding, but ignoring the source of the wound. The source of the wound goes so far back and blood is endless. I mean, we're standing literally on the blood of our brothers and sisters that's crying out from the earth that have been killed in the streets aimlessly through police brutality. But we also have even ignored the disproportionate number of veterans who've passed and died in, in foreign wars as a result of, um, you know, minorities going first or blacks being the highest number of deaths in the Vietnam conflict and war. Think for a moment about that blood. And, and most people are saying, just stop the bleeding, stop the looting, stop the rioting. Pastor Moody's right. It's it's a problem that the perpetrators of the injustice will have to deal with, but it's an embarrassing thing. It's quite embarrassing to have to admit for years I, 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 I overlooked people, for years I've marginalized people, for years I've not hired people because of the color of their skin, for years I miseducated my own people to keep a superiority mentality. It's amazing what people would think about someone else as opposed to looking at themselves as being imperfect or something wrong. When we got to Grand Rapids, um, we heard the term Grand Rapids nice. We heard the term Forest Hills nice. We heard the term Cascade nice. And nice is an acronym for not inclined to critically examine. We're not critically examining what it is that has transpired because we just want the bleeding to stop. But I'm here to tell you, it's been bleeding. We've been bleeding for a long time. This country is wounded from the inside out. And it's a cycle where there are tons and tons of blood being spilled in the street, proverbially speaking. And um, until justice rains down like the bloodshed, we're going to continue to have this agony, the agony of both peaceful and non-peaceful protests. Mm -hmm. Pastor Lachey, let me um, let me transition to to the next question. I I wanted to hear hear from you all because there for some people this topic is very familiar. The idea that that there's structural injustice, but for some people that term is new. They don't even they may not even understand um, that race has, they may not be aware that race has shaped the social, educational, economic disparities um, in our society. And so what, what I'd like you to talk about is how does this sin, which is also a structural sin, 
how do you see it? How have you seen it? How can we have better eyes to see it, ears to hear it, um, so that we can begin to begin to work effectively um, in in a, in a more self aware way? And that's a question to all panelists here. And perhaps give some examples so people can see you know, it with some clarity. One, uh, watch yourselves or watch others when they're around black people or people of color. When you see someone walking down the street and watch them, if they see a black person, they'll go across the street or watch them in the bus or airplane when they come to sit down, how reluctant they are to really sit next to a person on a flight going somewhere. Uh, pay attention to yourselves because what's ingrained in you some of you have been blind to, and that is your own racism. Uh, and that does, and that, and that can be cultural across the board in other countries as well. But right now in America, I like what Pastor L Lachey said about the triage, trying to stop the bleeding. But right now we're dealing with hemophilia and that won't stop the bleeding at all. Something has to coagulate it. If you want blood to be coagulated, you gotta find a way to stop it. And the way to stop it is to go straight to the root. Pay attention to what you do. Pay attention to how you think and be honest about it. Cultural competency assessments, I think, are if we're looking at the educational arena or the adaptability to some knowledge base, there is a, an instrument or a tool that I facilitate often, and it's it's um, a tool that assesses our level of both awareness, sensitivity, and then our willingness to make a change. Because there are so many people that go, yeah, I'm a racist, I grew up that way, I'll die that way. And then there are others who try to superimpose racism on the, the, the group of people that's being unjustly treated. A black person can't be racist. I know he says, well, well, black people are racist too. No, that that's based on the construct of understanding racism. It's impossible for a marginalized group to exercise racism when they've already been categorized by somebody who has deemed their race better than someone else's. And I'm not speaking um, generalities. I'm thinking specifics. Think about how high the 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 rung is for academic and educational success for somebody of color versus somebody who came from generations and generations of opportunity, education, and finance. So, so we go in, we start out at a disadvantage. An African-American student starts out at a disadvantage when he or she comes from a community that did not have the exact same uh, resources that somebody of uh, uh, the majority population comes from. And so those are the kinds of things that cultural competency heightens our awareness to, and it's not to victimize or, or uh, epitomize someone. It is simply awareness that simply says, you know what, I have a desire to change that. I have a desire to be a part of the solution and not a part of perpetuating the problem. Um, and, you know, it is the, the cumulative, the, it's the cumulative effect of this, right? So it's the in individual behaviors inside of institutions, people who are gatekeepers or who are decision makers, who are in positions to set policies. So we are, we are experiencing the momentum of history, the momentum of policies, the, the cumulative effect of all this bias and prejudice and discrimination. And when you have this cumulative effect, right, that, that's what structural racism is. That's what institutional racism is. It means that we've been doing it so long, it becomes normative. Norm. Well, mm -hmm. this is the way that we always do it. This is the way this social institution works. And, and social institutions then become blind to the policies or the behaviors or the decisions that they make that create barriers to other people because it's hard to see it as a barrier against a group of people because, oh, we love everybody. Everybody is welcome here. But if you have a, a policy that keeps people out, maybe not intentionally, but the impact is keeping people out. And so when we look at structural racism, right, we have to understand it begins in individual efforts, but it builds on the legacy 
of history. It builds on being embedded within social institutions that were never created for people of color in the United States. It, the social institutions, by social institutions, I am meaning whether we're talking about the criminal justice system, whether we're talking about the governmental system, the educational system, healthcare system, even the church, right? Because if you look at its origins in the United States, I wasn't allowed in the church. That's right. People who look like me weren't allowed in the church, right? That's why we get the black church. It's so sneaky, right? Um, and it's everywhere. Like what I learned in history class, whose history am I learning? When I go right. to the makeup counter and I can't even get like what matches my skin. When, like all these messages, when I watch a TV show and it has nothing to do with the way that I grew up, all of it sends these messages over generations that like you are American, but you're not really that American or you aren't really who we're talking about. This is what it really means. And here somewhere, right? And that sense just happens over and over again. Like when I think of the students that I work with, how many of them when they're in their classrooms are learning about people that look like them? How many of them are learning about are being taught by people that look like them? How many of them are learning about the problems of of the places that they come from or like their histories? Like it's very sneaky because we just think, oh, this is the way it is. This is the way it is for a centered group of people, but it's not the way it is for everyone. And I think it's just so sneaky because we just all, even us, it kind of internalizes enough that we're just like, oh yeah, this is the way it is. And then you have to stop and think and be like, no, that's not the way it is for a lot of people. Yeah, um, Jane, with you saying that, I think back to my um, graduate school days um, and full transparency of my undergraduate career at Calvin, graduate with degrees in sociology, right? From Calvin, Purdue. Do you know it was not until after I started teaching as a professor um, of sociology that I ever heard of a black sociologist or even read that there had been black sociologists. And it's not like they didn't develop until the 1980s. They had been around for a very long time. But nowhere in my formal education did I come across or did anyone introduce or make me aware that there were black sociologists, heck, that there were female sociologists. Um, it, so when we, we, we learn the same canon, and again, it's not always intentional. I think it starts out intentional and then it becomes habit and then it becomes normalized. And then it becomes that much harder to see. So when I talk about unlearning racism, you have to see it, you have to feel the pain of it, and you have to want to do something about it. Because we can we can raise awareness like, oh, the, the, the curriculum isn't that diverse. Yeah, I know, but I don't know how I'm going to be able to work it in, right? Because I got X, Y, and Z that I need to cover. There's just no way possible. That's not how I was trained. Guess what? I wasn't trained that way either. You have to want to do it and be willing to be uncomfortable enough, get out of the comfort zone in order to do it. And you'll only get out of your comfort zone if you feel like it matters. And we don't right. feel like it matters. Some of you might remember uh, Carter G. Woodson's book, The Miseducation of the Negro. Uh -huh. And exactly some of the things that you're saying, Dr. Page, uh, uh, somewhat deal exactly with that. Sometimes we've been miseducated to emulate the institutions that we're attending. And those institutions does not teach us about other individuals like us who also have uh, the same types of credentials. I attended Morehouse College and the Morehouse College was an awakening for me mm -hmm. because I learned so much about where a lot of African-American educators in our country uh, were doing, uh, whether they attended Morehouse or other historically black colleges. We have been uh, miseducated within ourselves because once again, I come back with this word, how we sometimes assimilate uh, to the environment in which we're living in uh, and we find ourselves trying to undo uh, something when we wake up to the fact that it's wrong and we're trying to undo our own re-education. Dr. King once said something that, that uh, I thought was so inspiring before he died. 
almost a month before he died in a conversation that he had with uh, Harry Belafonte. He told Harry Belafonte, he says, I believe that I'm sending our people into a burning house. Some of you may have heard this before. I may not be saying the exact same words, but I understand what he meant. I feel like I'm sending my people into a burning house. Belafonte asked him, why did he make that statement? He said, because I spent so much time trying to fight against integration and civil rights that I did not spend time teaching our people how to become economically strong. Our whole country is built on the basis of economics, and I think that that's one of the largest, um, I keep using the term perpetrators. It's a, it's a, it's a, a sad truth, a reality that the economic gap has everything to do with how racism is institutionalized and perpetuated generationally, because generational wealth um, is something that often we're born into or we create. And I, I don't know very many people that are my age, of my skin color, of my levels of education um, that can say, oh, we just came from, you know, generations and generations of wealth. Well, that, that's a very large gap. Education then becomes one of the keys to accessing wealth or creating generational wealth. So for the colleges or the university's purpose, it's important for access to be granted um, and then the willingness to learn or expand. I, I'm, I'm wondering how many of our listeners on the call have had an opportunity to be educated by watching the movie Selma. Um, that's something you can do from Netflix at home, um, reading or, or, or um, researching the life of Malcolm X. Um, many times we can look even across the water and, and find prototypes of leadership like Nelson Mandela's life and his fight and struggle against apartheid, which was also systemic. I mean, there are so many tools available, but are they embedded in our access to learning so that we can perpetuate uh, wealth, generational wealth understanding? I think that generational wealth is more knowledge than money. It's more it's more more knowledge based than it is economically based or, or dollar wise. So, so, so that's a, that's a, a, a challenge or a question that I have for both the educators as well as students that might be listening to this call. Thanks for that. Thank you for that really effective don't forget challenge. Oklahoma. Oh, sorry, Pastor Reverend Moody. I was telling Pastor Lachey, don't forget that Oklahoma uh, uh, had a Wall Street, an African-American community that was thriving in economics. Yes. It was and it was destroyed. Uh, and the purpose in which it was destroyed is because it was an institution that had been uh, uh, set in place that they had all the amenities that they needed. They had their own community that was, th that was thriving in their own banks. Mm -hmm. Because of one small incident, uh, they bombed that community from the air and yeah. sent, sent troops and killed those people, innocent people. Um, because they were thriving. Also, Oklahoma, you ought to look that up, your students, and, and, and read about it. Read about it. It's called Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And you have found ironically, it's 99 years. Yeah, ironically, it's 99 years to the date of our riots that just, just broke out. 99 years. I think that's something. That's all right. That's, an, that's right. That's telling us something. I would, I would for our, for our Calvin community listeners, um, with the hat I wear, we have cultural competency professional development activities every month. We even have opportunities this summer that are virtual. Three of them have been created, and then the um, Calvin Institute for Christian Worship is offering classes as well. You know, so I'm, I'm so passionate that even while <laughs> Just before that, one of the last things I did was to create these virtual opportunities so no one would have any excuses to say, well, there's no way that I can participate in anything. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. You can. Um, and you know what? Google it. Google. How do I become anti-racist? You'd be amazed at all the things that would, would come up. You look up everything else. If you can look up a... You know, banana bread recipe for this time is staying at home. You can look up a recipe. You can look up the recipe that's needed to help us um, individually and collectively to become much more aware of 
what is happening around us. I would say know your history, know other people's history, know the history, um, immerse yourself in, in history and in the sociology and the politics, exactly what we do as a liberal arts education, but we can do more to interject the, our collective history into all of that. And well, Dr. Move to another can question, add, if that's okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I add something else to what Dr. Tracy in reference to history? Uh, one of the most important things is that during the reconstruction years, and this is not taught in most white schools or even in the public schools, that during the reconstruction period of the 1800s, 1860s, there were 22 black men in Congress after 1865. And, and most of those men were Republicans and that's never talked about. Uh, so students or white students don't know uh, that there were 22 black men in Congress during the reconstruction period. And so when we hear black men and black women are in Congress, we get excited about it. But at the same time, um, we don't know that they were already there before. The ones well, come. Thank you for that. So there's a, so you're hearing, we're all hearing a lot of, about a lot of good resources, um, films, um, history, uh, educational resources and seminars for our folks. Um, so just a good reminder that, that, that and, and, the, and there are a large number of resources, not to mention asking questions in your own field of study. Um, who are the voices of color that, that I might not be learning about? Who should I be learning about? That's a, that's a great question to be asking your faculty members. And, um, and, if, and if they don't know, you know, that's an opportunity to learn together. Um, so, so I, I want to thank you for that. I want to, I, I don't want to move too quickly past sin <laughs> without talking about what is, if, if, if there's this individual sin and corp and collective sin and structural sin, what does repentance look like? What does confession look like for these kinds of sins and how should we be challenged to think about that? Because our temptation is to individualize it um, or marginalize it. But what is what is what is a shared understanding of repentance and confession look like? I love that question. And every time you mentioned it, I I think I'm programmed as a Pentecostal preacher to immediately respond when I hear the word sin, repent, sin, repent. <laughs> repent just immediately flows out of my mouth. When we think about how do we repent, it, it has two meanings scripturally. Um, in, in one instance, in the Old Testament, it just simply means to see things differently. And in the New Testament, it means to literally change your ways. And so if we do the, you know, the etymology of the word, um, we have to consider what does it mean to us? And from a, from a denominational perspective, which I don't necessarily um, strongly push denominational differences, but we all have different lenses to see it differently. Because some people think that if I hit you and I say, I'm sorry, I've repented. I don't believe that. I think that if I hit you and I say, I'm sorry, I've started the process of apologizing, but I've not truly repented until I have rectified the situation and I have also made a commitment with witnesses that I will no longer hit you again. And true repentance in this instance has to do with being obligated to change, but also being held accountable for change. Because if our denominational thoughts are, if we're once a Christian, we're always a Christian, no matter what we do, then repentance becomes very, very um, diluted. It becomes casual. It becomes, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, and I don't know how many times we can say, oh, I'm sorry, or I'm sorry that happened to you. And, and it just be accepted. But at some point, I've got to be so sorry that I'm going to step in and stop it from happening to you. And I'm going to rectify the situation, put the train back up on the right tracks and send it in the direction that it should go. And that's true repentance, because if we don't turn from our wicked ways, then we have no recourse of hearing from God. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn, repent from their ways, their wicked ways, then I will hear you from heaven and I'll heal your land and I will forgive you of your sin. And, and God is faithful in that way. But I, I just have to kind of soapbox that whole perspective because we were taught sin, repent, sin, repent, but it means to change literally. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you very much. 
Very well said. I really said. resonate with that in this time. Yeah. I think it's hitting me hardest this time that like, this is a third time in a month and this just keeps happening over and over again, right? And people just be like, yeah, I'm sorry that happened. And, and then like, next thing and then there's another incident and it's horrifying and we're sorry that happened and then it just happens over and over again i really like that idea that there needs to be restitution we have to commit to restitution and what reverend moody was saying earlier about this isn't a like i think what happens is we think this is something bad that happened to my black brothers and sisters but really this is an everyone problem like reverend moody was saying all of us together so then we have to say this is where i was wrong and this is what's happening and how do we fix it together? Like we have to fix it. And it just makes me sad that like, it makes me tired. And I'm sure if I'm tired, you guys are tired, right? It makes me so tired that like, why do we do this over and over again? Why can't somebody, like, why can't we? There's no somebody, it's us, right? Why can't we fix this problem so that it doesn't keep happening? It's yeah, um, and Jane, you know, I, I, I appreciate again and just what you've said and just want to reiterate as well as what everybody um, has contributed but no racism is is not just something bad that happens to people of color racism um, affects everybody racism affects everybody um, it affects the majority it affects the marginalized because we can't have a people group that is discriminated against or on the bad side of injustice without or without the other side of privilege, without the other side of people who are committing the injustices, without the other side of people who benefit from that, right? So it affects us all. It affects, it affects us all. Um, and when we are blind to how it impacts our individual lives, we're blind to how it can impact someone else's life. So when, when if, if my white brothers and sisters don't realize that they have a race and that their life is also racialized, that how they move through the different spheres that, of influence that they have and the different social gatherings that they have, if they don't recognize that when they move into these areas as a white person that their race matters, they will never understand that my race matters when I walk into a room, when I walk into um, a meeting, to the airport, um, walking down the street, because of everyone has to realize that we live in a very racialized society and whether or not you see how your own race matters, my race does shape my life. And, I'm, and I have a lot of privilege associated with my identities. I'm Christian, I'm straight, um, I'm highly educated, happily married, have my own home, have a job, even the privilege of being able to work from home just before I took a leave. I have a lot of privilege going for me, but even with all this privilege going for me, I'm still impacted by this because when I walk down the street, when I go someplace new, even if I'm walking on my own campus in some place um, and someone doesn't know me, I am assuming the first thought is not, I bet that's a woman has a PhD that she's ordained and that her three children happened after she was married. And they're all by the same guy. I don't, I don't think that's what people think about me. And I say that because I've experienced it. Oh, oh, you're not one of them. Oh, you're an exception. Oh, you're, you're special. Or, or, or you're kind of like us. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And it is sad that I played by the rules. I have gotten the education. I have done everything right. And I still have to put up with this crap. It's not fair. I would like to affirm what you're saying, Dr. Page, about um, people's perception. If I shared my story, I won't go into the details of growing up in poverty, abstract poverty on the east side of Detroit, but also being a, a, a military kid traveling from place to place. I've had Upper Peninsula, UP, Marquette, Michigan experiences. I've had Detroit 
East Side experiences. I've had Michigan State University experiences with nooses and 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 marches and sit-ins and and I've had those experiences, but these are the exact same experiences that somebody that is two generations removed from me either way is experiencing. So, so two generations above me or two generations um, behind me are experiencing the exact same things, which means that we've got some work that has to take place so that people can see you for who you are without you having to post up that this is what you've accomplished or this is where you are. You know, um, I think about the percentage of people who have doctoral degrees and, and I'm working on one right now um, at Cornerstone. And, and, and I think about what an elite environment it's supposed to take me to. But it's not an elite environment when people are going to continue to disrespect you or put you in a category of which um, they can marginalize you because of the color of your skin. I've been told many, many times, oh, you don't, you don't look as angry as, as, um, as the other black men. I've been told that. I mean, what, I mean, first of all, so how do you look angry? And if somebody looks angry, that means you push them far beyond the limits of their capacity to where now they're manifesting the anger of, or an angst that has been put against them. So, so I don't know what that means. And yes, there are also um, some stereotypes and biases and bigotries that we've experienced um, just this week or last week, or, you know, I, I shared on another call, I was walking in my own neighborhood trying to stay healthy and a man comes out of his garage and I said, Hey, how's it going? You know, waving and keeping moving mask and all. He says, um, so are you behaving or haven't you got caught yet? And it took me back. Cause I didn't know, I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know what to say, but it was the day after Ahmaud Aubrey was shot and killed for trespassing in a neighborhood that he didn't belong. I don't know if that man's perception is that I belong or don't belong. I just know that what he said to me was off color and out of sorts. And if I made a big deal out of it, then then the media would be, you know, it, then, oh, he's just an angry black man. And that's not the case. So so I, I, I swallowed that and I just kept, kept moving, kept going, but I'll keep telling it until people are taken aback by those types of statements and be careful not to say them. Be careful not to open your mouth and pass a judgment or say something to somebody that would offend them, even though they've worked just as hard, if not harder, to get to where they are as anyone else. I thank you for saying that, Pastor Lachey, because I've been, I've have experienced somewhat something of the same. But what I began to learn, if we go back and we talk about sin and we talk about repentance, we have to look at white society and how they have taught children to disrespect African-American men and women. And if you understand history of the South and even the North, we were never considered to be men. We were always boys and gals. And that stuff is taught to children white children at that particular period of time, and that stuff has still trickled on down to today. So when individuals make those kinds of comments, it really goes back to their childhood because in essence, the police was designed to track down slaves. They were designed to bring slaves back to their masters. They were never designed to uh, work against the status quo or the very people who control them. They were designed to control people of lower means, such as Black, Hispanic, Indian, and other cultures. I want to make it clear, racism is taught in education, and it starts at home, and it goes back to the church until those two things repent of itself, we will continue to perpetuate the same racial environment with racial hatred. When we talk about God and God's justice, God said, let us make man in our image and the likeness of ourselves. Let us give he, them, male, female, male authority on the planet. He gave us authority. We have misused the authority that God has given us because we know God is not a God of hate. 
We talk about love, but we don't show the love. He showed us a greater love by bringing Christ into the world to die for our sins, but he brought Christ into a world where the world still had racial hatred against the people. That's where we got to start at. We got to get back to re-educating and we got to talk about repentance. And even if it comes to the point where someone says, uh, are you keeping up trouble or you have, are you in trouble? I would have, I don't know if I would have did what you did, uh, Reverend. I don't know if I would have kept going. I think I'd have challenged him. What kind of trouble have you been in, sir, to make that kind of statement? Or what you doing in my neighborhood? That's what I'd be saying. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for those words. Um, and, and Pastor Moody, you led us into thinking about God's love and justice. And so we've talked about sin and we've talked about repentance. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what God's justice means in this moment. And for us, uh, we who are, love God and we know God loves all creation, all people and seeks justice and hates evil. So talk to us about what those principles mean in the manifestation of uh, our life in 2020 in Grand Rapids. For me, in the United States. Justice means righteousness. That's where I stand with that word. Justice equals righteousness. And you can't get justice, well, I'll put it this way, you can't get righteousness in an unjust situation. That's why we got the riots. That's why we got people tearing up stuff because they see an unjust circumstance and they've been seeing it for years. We all have. Think about it. Why are white people out there protesting with black people? Because they're beginning to see that mom and dad have been lying to them about relationships with black people for years or other peoples of color. Now, some are out there for the wrong reasons, but the ones who are out there for righteousness are seeking justice in the same manner of righteousness. And and that's what you have to deal with. If we look at that and see it for itself, our young people are saying, America, you are not great. And if you are thinking about making America great again, you have lost it because you have been unjust. There is no righteousness until you bring justice. Here's a question. Can you restore something to greatness that could never pride itself in being great from the beginning of its origin? Um, I think something that we can agree upon is that what makes America unique is that it was supposed to be a God-fearing country that had independence from sovereign rule of a human. That, that was the pretense. And in 1776, there were signatures that were signed on a declaration of that independence. However, um, if there was a person of color in the room, one, you didn't know it, but two, they were probably serving somebody. And then almost 100 years later in 1863, we get the signing of an Emancipation Proclamation that is also um, um, less than substantial in identifying uh, who we supposed to be are as a just country who's one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Justice has been misinterpreted and I saw a hyphenation of that word where it was just us. And when people take on that identity that justice is good when it's in my favor, justice works when I can put you away from me, that's not justice at all. I think that the biblical reference to justice has to do with equity and it has to do with the word that we know as shalom. And to borrow from our Jewish brothers and sisters, shalom is not just a greeting, it's an actual lifestyle. It is a style of living that puts God where he's supposed to be, that keeps us where we're supposed to be toward one another. And and, and I think until we investigate shalom, until we recognize and embrace what shalom really means, we'll never have justice, at least not here in America. And I also think that what justice means is equity. Um, 
Because, and I, and I, I've always emphasized equity as opposed to equality, because I think equality has been only thought of as equality of opportunity and not equality of outcome, or at least the possibility of equality of outcome. Um, and so I think for true justice, there needs to be equity um, and there needs to be accountability. There will be no justice without accountability. Um, and I'm talking about accountability on all levels until we hold accountable those people who feel free to throw around microaggressions because they feel like it um, and they feel it's their right to do it for free speech until we all hold them accountable for saying those kinds of things and not giving people a pass until we hold our social institutions accountable for the ways that they have um, Invested or divested. I mean, earlier on the, on the, you know, just momentarily at noon, I watched the news because I wanted to make sure if there was anything I needed to be aware of for um, today's conversation. And I saw, you know, CEOs of major corporations in the United, you know, in, in Michigan saying we're, we're here to proclaim that, you know, we stand against racism and we're going to do what's right. I wish I could have been encouraged. Because I, because I wanted to talk back. If I was there, I would have had to restrain myself to say, "Well, what have you been doing the last fifty years? What, what, what have you been doing since the civil rights movement? If you're just now awakening to the fact that your corporation has had practices and policies that have not been treating people equitably, um, what have you been doing? Okay, I'm glad you're awake now, but okay, what's going what's going to be different? Um, except maybe you hire someone like city professional or consultant or pastor Lache to come in and help you see your ways and you feel good, you have a strategic plan. All right, that's good. And then nothing changes in the culture because the hearts haven't been changed. So what what is justice justice means your heart is broken and your heart is changed it means accountability it means equity which means for a period of time it's not going to be everybody gets exactly the same thing because we have to get people to playing ground level playing ground and that scares people because we well, everybody has the same. We don't. And as long as you think of everybody having the same and you keep doing the same thing, saying, well, we opened the door. Well, you opened the door, but I don't have a path to the door. You open the door, but there's no path for me to stay in the room. You open the door, but it's a revolving door. And that's what gets me um, is that it's a revolving door. Yes, come in and go right back out. Come in, go right back out. Come in, go right back out. Because hearts aren't changed. And I don't know what it's going to take for hearts to be changed. I think people, I so resonate with that. I think people often say justice comes when we fix a broken system. I don't think the system is broken. I think it's doing exactly what it was meant to do, right? which is center certain people and marginalize other people. And so until like all of us that work in diversity, we feel this. It's like you come in, you put a bandaid on the problem because we want to fix the broken system. And I think justice won't come until we recognize that the system is unjust. It started unjust. It started unjustly. It didn't start. This country wasn't built for everyone in the beginning. And we have to recognize that and see like how we fix that. Right. I, I just. I get tired. I mean, we're all tired, but of hearing like, well, let's just fix the broken system. The prison system is broken. Is it broken or is it doing exactly what you meant it to do from the beginning? Good point. Good point. Very good point. It is, it is, it is working in the manner in which it should. Uh, I remember I was in college and I was working on a paper and I can't remember the title of the, I can't remember the author of the book. But the book was entitled A Community Under Self-Control. Now, what did that mean? Uh, as I was reading through it, I read some lines that said that our system is designed to be a successful failure, which means that 
the prison system is a success, but it's a failure. It's a success in terms of what Mrs. Um, Jane said, is that it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And the failure part is that we're saying it's broken, so therefore it's a failure. It's being successful. The political arena is being successful. And that political realm in which we see the elections and the uh, opportunities for people to vote when they didn't have a chance to vote back in the early uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when we had voter oppression. Uh, whenever things become so broken, the system sees that as a success because it works to their advantage. And I, I, I want to be clear about something because I'm sure there's some Calvin people saying I never heard Michelle talk like that before. Um, that's because I am pushed to the end. Um, I am at capacity. But I want to be clear. The reason I have been this long at this institution is because I think change is possible. And, and the change is possible because we are a Christian organization. Change is possible because there are people who want to see the change happen. So hear my, hear my pain. And, and you won't hear me sound a hopeful note because I'm not hopeful in the moment. But I will be hopeful maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after, maybe when I get back in August, um, I, can, I can be hopeful. But this is, this is hard work. This is hard work. And I cannot tell you the emotional toll that people like Jane and Christina and everyone else who cares deeply about these things experience in these kind of moments, but also in the moments where it doesn't make national attention. Also in the moments where the work that we do is dismissed as not enough, as too late, and do you really care, and you have bought into the system. I have had people tell me, you can't possibly do this work here because you've been here so long. Really? Really? Hear me. Hear us. See us. Lament with us. And then work with us. If you don't like the way the institution is, then show up. Show up and do the work with us. I'll be happy to take a seat. I'll be happy to retire. If my retirement will tomorrow would guarantee it would be better. Show up. So that sense of hopelessness, I think is resident in many of us because of how long we've seen go unchecked. And now that America's burning, we have an opportunity to change some things. We have an opportunity, and I agree with you that unless we show up, speak up, look up, we're not going to get anything done. And um, I often say that you should leave a room better than you found it because that's what my mother taught me. We enter into spaces that become rooms, become virtually chat spaces that we should leave them better than we found them. That should be our intent, as opposed to just acknowledging that it's torn down, that it's broken, or that it's successfully broken. We got to do something to make it better it's on every account, whether we're being victimized or whether we're the perpetrators. We have to do better to get better to make things better, and that's the only glimmer of hope. The only glimmer of hope is that we're gonna fight till we die. <laughs> you know, one of our traditional songs is, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. You know, uh, I got my war clothes on in the army of the Lord. These are our songs that we have sang, and these are called callback songs. These were the things that got us through the roughest times when we were turned away or treated negatively, no matter how professional we tried to present ourselves or no matter how high our degree level, you can have more degrees than a thermometer, but you're still black in America and that's rough. 
So I, I, I empathize with you and I, I agree that somebody's got to speak up. Somebody's got to show up. We're praying up. Now we got to act up. I, I agree. Uh, I am thinking of a Psalms, but I just can't remember the, the number. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalms one. Psalms one. Thank you. I was having a senior moment. I'm 64 now. And up there. But I, I, I say that because um, as Dr. Page has not just challenged her colleagues, but all of us, but more so your colleagues got to step up. Remember, I said earlier, and I reiterate this, that racism is a white person's problem because they perpetrate it. We are the recipients of it. We've been trying to deal with racism. We've been trying to deal with deal with it from a justice standpoint. We've been praying to God from, from the valley to the mountain to overcome. I believe we have overcome. I believe that our friends who are white still have yet to overcome. That's why I said that Psalms, blesses the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. For there are people who want to walk right but are getting some bad advice and some ungodly advice. And maybe that godly advice, maybe to some degree, uh, uh, sounds like it's right, but it's wrong. It's wrong. So I agree, uh, I can't be a racist. I can discriminate, but I can't be a racist. I don't have the power. But from a God man standpoint, I grew up in the Methodist church under the on, under the history of John Wesley, in which most Calvinists believe in John Wesley, as I presume, uh, who wanted to have the power of the Holy Spirit move mightily. But the Spirit of God is moving mightily and is moving in a manner that we feel is disruptive, but it's a manner to change the mindsets of mankind. COVID-19 just pulled the covers deeply off of racism, and we're looking at it and now the perpetrators of racism got to do something about it. So did you have something you wanted to? I was just going to say, um, Pastor Lachey had brought up a song and I said the only song that has been, one of the songs, I say one of the songs has been carrying me lately is, you know, the phrase is, um, nobody told me the road would be easy, but I don't <laughs> believe you brought me this far to leave me, right? So nobody told me, I'm under no illusion under no illusion that this is easy work, no illusion that my calling to Calvin is easy, no illusion that my calling um, to be a bridge maker is easy. I'm under no illusion. Nobody told me it would be easy, um, but I don't believe God brought me this far um, to leave me hopeless, to leave us hopeless. Um, and so I'm grateful and thankful to, that God is not going to leave us in this time that we need him the most. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're, I'm going to ask Pastor Moody to close in prayer in just a moment, but I want our community to know, the Calvin community to know that this is not a one-off event, um, that, that we have more work to do and we're trying to figure out how to do it in this COVID environment. How do you have a, a incarnate relational conversation, um, in a disembodied technologically distant sort of way. And we know we need more time for lament. We need more time to hear um, what our students think and feel. Um, and and, uh, and, and it, as of this weekend, what I was trying to figure out is how do we gather at least and hear from the wise, wise people in our midst. And I'm very grateful to you, Michelle, and, and to you, Terrence, and to you, Jane, and to you, Nathaniel. Very grateful that you could be wise elders in our midst at this at this juncture but what is very clear if we take away anything is that we've got more work to do and um, we've got more listening to do we've got more learning to do we've got more changing um, to do we've got to turn from our habits and ways that have reinforced a, a, a racist set of structures that have marginalized um, so many and harmed so many um, so with that uh, I, I want to invite Pastor Moody to close our time in prayer and um and i want to let our community know that that we will continue to schedule more and i'm going to jealously protect 
Dr. Lloyd Page's leave time. So we're gonna we're gonna draw on other friends and resources as we do this work um, because it is time for some to rest too. So Amen. Shall we bow? Father, we humble ourselves under the canopy of heaven, giving you thanks for all things. For thou art the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of Israel. And truly, Jesus the Christ of Nazareth, who died on the cross and whose blood was shed for our sins, is your son. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. We thank you, Father, for this conversation that we have had today. We pray, Father, that to some it may be hard, to some it might not be as easy as expected, but Lord, we pray that someone would got, will have gotten something out of this today. You said in your word, Lord, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and all your righteousness, that you would add all these things unto us. Help us all seek your kingdom, Father, that you may add unto us, Lord, what we are in need of to overcome our disappointments, to overcome our disadvantages, and to overcome our hatred or our racism toward any particular culture or group of people within our midst. Help us to transform and change our ways, Lord. Help us to repent. And in repenting, let us see the actions of our own repentance that we know that we have changed our thoughts. For you said, Lord, that we are to be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may be able to understand and know what your will is and not to be conformed to this world, Father. Help us to know, Lord, that this world it's not the world that you intended for it to be. Help us to focus on the spiritual world that you have inside each and every one of us, that we may walk in that light of truth and knowledge and understanding. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you to you all. And thanks for those in attendance. We really appreciate your presence here today. Thank you, Dr. Leroy. Thank you, Dr. Leroy. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, Jane, and thanks, uh, Michelle, for sharing your hearts appreciate yeah. it thank you very much pastors and michelle and james so grateful for for you and what a gift you are to our this to this community so thank you bye we'll talk All right. praying for you dr page